be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for an amazing journey halfway through the Reformation history of Luther's life. Help us as we come to this very important theological um, writing of Luther's and Erasmus and this debate. And also look at Luther's struggles with his health. And then as we're away from this class this summer, let us continue to read and study, inspire us, so that when we come back in September and we move to the Augsburg Confession and really the birth of the Reformation and Lutheranism, we pray that we'll be ready to celebrate 500 years of Reformation history and your continued reforming work in the church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you missed last week... Hello, Mark. If you missed last week, remember I'm the curator, I'm not the scholar. I love Luther and I love to read about him and I love what he's written, most of all. Uh, I have tried in this class for you to get to hear from Luther. Because as good as all the biographies are, they, you know, when somebody tells you about somebody, they can't do it without some kind of filter. So I've been trying to help you read as much as possible. Um, probably next year, fall, and then even after the first of the year, 2018, uh, we're just going to spend some more time reading Luther. Yeah, because I think that's, that's really helpful and important. So, um, curator, I've been curating resources. Remember now, just setting the stage again, John the Steadfast is now the elector. John Frederick has passed away. He's died. And so John the Steadfast, um, brother of Prince Frederick, is now in charge of Luther's part of Judith, Germany. And it continues to steadfastly uh, protect Luther. Um, remember John Bugenhagen becomes Luther's pastor and very close friend, along with Philip Melanchthon, um, who is his close colleague, but we've talked in this class about how different they are, and those differences are going to come up more and more now as we proceed on into the Reformation. Last week we celebrated Martin and Katie's marriage, 1525. Luther's 43, he's born in uh, 1492. You can remember that, by the way, because it's just 10 years after... Yeah, no, it's the same. No, he was born in 1482. It's, it's 10 years before Columbus did his thing. So, anyway, that's a way you can remember his uh, birth year. Although we're not totally sure when he was born because of the way they kept records. But that's pretty much the consensus, 1482. So he's in early 40s when he uh, marries... Catherine von Bora, and we celebrated her life last week. Just a few review quotes. Um, Melanchthon says this about uh, Luther. I have hopes that this state of life will sober him down and that he will discard the low buffoonery that we have So he hopes that you know, Catherine will bring him down to earth a little bit, which she does. Um, uh, lovely quotes from Luther. A man has strange thoughts the first year of marriage, but sitting at table he thinks, before I was alone, now there are two. Or in bed, when he wakes up, he sees a pair of pigtails lying beside him, which he hadn't seen there before. When it comes to the effect of Luther's marriage, I love what Lola Nelson say here, gone was any medieval idea of fleeing the body to free the soul. This whole no almost Gnostic view that the body was bad and the spirit is good. Um, the body is good. So within God intended limits, this is very important, flesh was good, sex to be enjoyed, family life to be honored, food to be relished, and the physical stuff of life to be appreciated as the gift from God that it was. We'll talk some more about Katie and Luther's household in the fall. When we do that, I've got some great pictures of some of you who have visited uh, Wittenberg, and you've gone down with the big wine barrels, or beer, I don't know whether it's beer or wine, but probably wine barrels, and all that Katie did in Luther's household. It was amazing. But you can go down, and they've excavated underneath the monastery where they did a lot of their hosting and, and cooking and preparing of you know, the, the wine and the beer and all that good stuff. So, anyway, we'll talk some more about that in the fall. Richard um, Luther says, I am rich. 
My God has given me a nun and has added three children. I don't worry about my debts, for when Katie has paid them, there will be more. <laughs> we, we had this one from last week. So, so Katie definitely uh, righted Luther's ship. Um, she made things work. She had a, a mind for administration that Luther uh, didn't. Um, so I, I didn't quote this last week, and this is one more, um, I, I think, very affectionate word that Luther says about Katie. I wouldn't give up my Katie for France or Venice. First, because God gave her to me and gave me to her. By the way, that's one of the most clear explanations of what marriage is. Marriage, you know, is God gives you the person. And God gives you to that person. That's that's a big, a beautiful um, thought about marriage. Second, because I've often observed that other women have more shortcomings than my kids. <laughs> Although she too, yeah, she has some shortcomings. They're outweighed by many great virtues, though. And third, because she keeps faith in marriage. That is fidelity and respect. Oh, all right. Beautiful. So that's just a review of Kate, Katie and Luther's marriage from last uh, week. And we'll, we'll be talking about Katie and Luther. So, it's important at this stage in the Reformation, as we move past 1525, the Peasants War, the death of Prince Frederick, Luther's marriage, um, that we note that Luther starts to have some really significant and serious illnesses. In 15, uh, by 1527, Luther has severe health issues, and China, we start to see signs of heart issues, um, and he... It see, people have debated, debated, debated about the relationship between his health issues and his spiritual um, struggles. Uh, there's certainly a relationship there because one affects the other. Uh, Luther's 45 or so. Um, we hear about sermons being interrupted by dizziness. Um, Bugenhagen, Luther's pastor and close friend, reports an event in 1527 where Luther actually thought he was dying. He, was ready to go. It was so bad. He had this, this buzzing in his ear he complained about, and he had all his friends come, and he was in such pain and agony, he really thought he was dying. Uh, this is uh, from Martin Breck. Luther was bothered by severe buzzing in his left ear, and he wanted to lie down. But before doing so, he grew worse and asked Jonas for water, or I'll die. He became cold, and he thought his last hour had come. In a loud prayer, he surrendered himself to God's will. After saying the Lord's Prayer, he recited the two penitential psalms. Remember that Luther had those memorized, all the psalms at this point in his life, because he worked through them daily. Um, uh, o Lord, rebuke me not in my anger, Psalm 6, and have mercy on me, O God, according to thy steadfast love, Psalm 51. After they had put him to bed, he continued praying. He was prepared to die in this way, although he would rather shed his blood as a martyr for God's word. This is Brecht's summary of stuff Luther wrote about this moment of Bugenhagen and other people. Um, so, um, he, I'd rather die as a martyr than go this way, but he, he really believed this was it. But, obviously it wasn't. <laughs> he pulled through, he woke up the next morning, and he was better. It's crazy how that happened. Um, visited up one of our members. She was getting ready to die. She's in the hospital. And I showed up in the afternoon later this, in the week, this past week, and she said, she was sitting up with this big smile on her face. I woke up and I was just doing great. So, I don't know. It's crazy. All right. So, here's the other important event. The plague is, you know, always there in this time in history, and it strikes Wittenberg um, in, in this year in a, in a more severe way. Sometimes you'd have a few outbreaks, but, but a significant outbreak of the plague. Um, Luther is urged, you've got to leave, because we can't lose you. Um, as many of the faculty of the Wittenberg University do leave, they actually move classes and everything to a nearby town. What does Luther do? This is what Brecht says. Fear of the plague, which had already claimed its first victims among Luther's acquaintances, began to spread. For this very reason, Luther considered it his duty to remain, along with the pastor, Buchenhagen, and, he, and the chaplains, George Rohr and Johannes Mantel. 
he too participated in pastoral care. The wife of Hilo Dini, the uh, burgomaster, died virtually in Luther's arms. The great number of deaths immobilized the people. In mid-September, he gave diggers, in uh, mid-September, the grave diggers were drunk at some of the burials, and as one might suspect, dealt rudely with family members. Luther spoke about this from the pulpit and admonished people, especially in the time of danger, to demonstrate love for their neighbor. He rebuked those who left their wives because of the plague. So this was a big issue. Do you flee? Do you not flee? Um, there were so many deaths that you know, these great diggers were you know, drunk and intoxicated while they were doing their work. And so, so this is the nitty-gritty stuff, right? Luther has someone die in his arms, suffering from I think we need to hold that up. Um, so, there we go. Um, this Anfekung in German is the word, this spiritual affliction, this agony that Luther would often go through, continues. He has bouts with this, and again, Katie, Bugenhagen, and Melanchthon are the ones who seem to be able to get him out of it. So, you know, this person that really gave rebirth to the word in the church and to our understanding of grace and mercy of God, that the righteousness that we have is a gift of God, he constantly struggled with this. I guess I want to stop at this point and tell you that, because so often we make of our heroes stones. You know, like, oh, they're perfect. Like, people who have never read the Bible think that all the biblical characters were these stellar, perfect people. If you read the Bible, you know that's not true. You're just like them. I mean, you, you're, you're, Jesus called people. Who did he call to be ministers? Who did he call to be disciples? Did he find the people with great faith? What did he call his disciples in Matthew? What did he call them? Ye of? That's who he calls. You, have, you feel you have little faith sometimes? Join the club. You're just the kind of people Jesus picked. Okay? So Luther was a human being, and he really struggled. And this, this kind of spiritual affliction and depression, again, people of armchair quarterback to all these things, whether it's a psychological problem, you know, mental health issue, um, I think all of those things go too far. Um, I could say this, that Luther's big uh, medicine was the gospel um, for his struggle. And, and that's what his friends brought him, and that's what he bring out of these really difficult bouts. So this is just to finish this little section on Luther's health. Um, Breck says, when we survey Luther's illnesses after 1527, it is obvious that in the meantime, he had become an unstable man. Again and again can be seen the connection between his circulatory problems and an emotional depression combined with his spiritual unfect. But one should be cautious about making a diagnosis of a specific psychological illness. Luther sought to deal with his illness in his own way, which is just what I said, which was primarily a spiritual one. He hardly let the condition of his health deter him from accomplishing his many tasks. So as hard as it was, he kept on. So with that, we come to this very important um, struggle with Erasmus. So we're going to spend about 20 minutes with this, and then we'll pick up in September with this. Because um, let's help, let me just help you understand how important um, this is. Maybe this would be your summer reading project. Uh, so, Bondage of the Will, some people don't think is a good translation of the German, but this is Luther's writing um, in, in battle with... Erasmus, who you see a picture of. Let me remind you, who is Erasmus? He is the scholar, the mind of Europe in Luther's day. Hands down. He was held up as the most intelligent, the brightest, the most reasoned, the sharpest um, scholar around. Um, so, so Luther's battling Rome still, remember? Okay, he's under the ban, so he can be killed at any time. The enthusiasts, the more radical reformers, are going and doing all kinds of stuff that Luther thought, you know, he was pulling his hair out about what they were doing. But now steps up his really most formidable foe, and that is the great mind of Erasmus, of Rotterdam. 
No. Um, Erasmus is, like I said, very uh, well respected, but he's also sympathetic to Luther. He loved what Luther was trying to do to clean up the church. He was embarrassed by the, um, you know, by the corruption uh, of the church. And so he was fairly critical of that as well, but he was a solidly within the church scholar. He was not going anywhere, and he was fully supportive of the Pope's authority, um, but he really liked that Luther was trying to clean up the church. Which, by the way, most Catholics today would totally agree that it needed cleaning up, and you had the Council of Trent, and you had the, the, the Counter-Reformation, -ref as sometimes it's called. So, so the Catholic Church certainly did respond to some of this. Uh, but now, but the, the clash happens over um, Luther's most fundamental conviction, and that is human nature. What is the nature of man or humanity? What is the nature? How messed up are we? <laughs> it's really the question. And Christians do not answer this question the same. You need to know this. <clears throat> Calvinists, the Presbyterians, and the Lutherans, when it comes to this human nature thing, were pretty much in lockstep. The Catholics and the Baptists, actually, are very similar to some degree. Those folks are going to say that no, human beings are sinful, we are, there's no question, but we have the ability to improve ourselves, to strive for God, and to meet God. Um, so in the, in the Baptist lingo, you'll hear people say, well, have you made a decision for Christ? Lutherans would say, you can't make a decision. The only decision you can make for Christ is, you know, in and of yourself. So there's a capacity. So, 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 so within Christianity, and I don't mean to be critical of Catholics or Baptists, this is a conversation that is really important that we have. And I think there's strengths and weaknesses in every, every sign. Uh, but this is what becomes the main issue. Erasmus believes, um, fully rooted in some of the Greek thoughts and Aristotle, that human beings have a capacity to if not meet God halfway, you know, um, we have the capacity to improve ourselves, to better ourselves, um, and that we're not completely bankrupt. But let me, let's, let me flesh it out some more. Let me just say that enough to move on. So Erasmus writes a thing on what you've heard called free will. I hear that from every Christian. Well, we have free will. You know, I, I chose to put on my golf shirt today. And it's hot. I wanted to do that. I could have put on a different shirt. This is not what Luther's talking about with free will. Everybody has freedom to make choices. Whether you eat that thing or don't eat it or whatever. Whether you know what, whether you get out of bed or not. Or, you know, we all have choices. That's not what Luther's talking about. When it comes to God, do we have free will? Can we choose God? And uh, Erasmus was, in essence, saying yes. And when it came to Scripture, um, well, I'll save that. Erasmus writes this beautiful writing on free will. And so Luther has to respond. Because Erasmus is attacking a fundamental principle of Reformation theology and Luther's theology. And that's this. We do not have free will when it comes to choosing God. We are in bondage to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. So, Luther had hoped that he could avoid this battle, because he knew Erasmus was, his, was big time. This was not going to be a difference. So really what we get to in this discussion is the difference between a humanistic understanding of man and the Reformation understanding. So free will, all, little, or none. Here you go. I'm trying to simplify this. Um, are we free? Are we a little free? Or are we not free at all? Well, in backdrop to this debate that Luther and Erasmus end up having, a lot of Erasmus' students are moving to Luther's side on this. They're becoming convinced. And so, you know, I can tell you this. 
when one of my flock start to go flirting around with some other thinking that Luther. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I go, wait a minute. Crisis. No. It's a little bit like that. It's like your favorite students are going to the your the guy that you your you know your uh, adversary to some degree. Um, so that's a part of it. So this is Erasmus's view. Erasmus for and now this I don't let me because I mentioned different like the Catholic view and the Baptist view. Now I so let that go. I'm not saying that Baptists believe what Erasmus believes. Okay, so that is way more complicated. Than that. But so let's just go to the Erasmus. Um, for Erasmus, true religion was basically a matter of inclination of the heart, the wisdom that filled the mind, and the attitude of love for one's neighbor. True doctrine played little part in it. He despised Luther's teachers, the scholastic theologians, not because they taught false doctrines, but because they taught too many doctrines. <laughs> so Erasmus says, look, this is really, you guys are making Christianity too dogmatic, too doctrinal with all this stuff about being in bondage to will and the righteousness of God being imputed or, or how it's done. Look, it's pretty simple. You know, be good to your neighbor. Be a Christian. You know, have piety. Pray to God. Love your neighbor. Let's forget about all this doctrine stuff. Or maybe not forget about it, but let's, you guys are making it way too complex, which is interesting coming from such an amazing intellect. That that's what he thought. Too many doctrines. It's too much of a heavy. Well, what do you think about that? I hear people say that all the time about Christianity today. For instance, all right, I want you to close your eyes because I want this to be an anonymous survey. <laughs> <laughs> Promise, all right, close your eyes, and I won't look at individuals, but I have to look. Close your eyes. How many of you, you're going to have three options now. You're going to have positive view, ambiguous, that is, I'm in the middle, it's neither good or bad, or a negative view. So positive, ambiguous, not good or bad, or negative. When you hear the word dogma, raise your hand if that has a negative connotation to you. It's okay. It's okay if it does. Okay? Yeah, good. How about ambiguous? Neither good nor bad. All right? When you hear dogma, how many people feel a positive vibe? Okay. All right, put your hands down. Open your eyes. There's only about six of you that had a positive view of dogma. About maybe close to the other half had an ambiguous view and the other half had a negative view. Why? Because dogma is a head game. It's what we do to exclude each other from other things. We kill each other over it. I don't know, but dogma's got a bad name. Well, you and Erasmus would get along just fine. <laughs> That's what Erasmus believed. So Luther argued that when it comes to God, though, a person is completely in bondage and cannot choose the good or improve one's situation. In the, you can understand in the, in the Roman Catholic Church and kind of the system uh, of Luther's day, I won't necessarily go to today because I'm not an expert on that at all, I'm probably not an expert back then, but there was this concept that, yeah, you, all Christians believe in grace, people. When, people, when I hear Lutherans say, oh, we're about grace, that is so arrogant. <laughs> Are you serious? Do you think that Presbyterians don't believe in grace? Or Catholics don't believe in grace? Or the Ro Everybody believes in grace, Okay. Everybody believes that they read the Bible, that this is a gift of grace, um, you know, but how much do you, but the trick here is, is it grace alone? Or is it a combo of us striving for God and then God meeting us? Well, in the Catholic system, you know, you were expected to, to respond and work your way, you know, um, to do these good things in response to God's grace. No question. But Luther wanted to make it very black and white. <coughs> when it comes to your salvation, it's totally grace and nothing of your work. Not even your decision. You can't make a decision. 
Now, here's the trick semantic game. Of course you have to. You know, there's some response. You know, the Gospel of John, I love what John says. He says, those who, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, those who receive. That's a more biblical term than choose. I'm not sure. If you went and looked in the New Testament, have you made a personal decision for Jesus? See if you can find that kind of language. Yes, it'll talk about faith. Is that the same as a personal decision? But it does talk about receiving something. So Luther would say, the most we can do, and Calvin would be right along with him on this, the most we can do is receive. We're beggars. Luther, when he died, he said we're beggars. Just to that's, 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 that's what we are. We, that's all we can do. Um, Luther, of course, you know, of course, all Christians have biblical support for their different viewpoints. And so, so, but this is what Luther wanted to say. We are in bondage to sin. We cannot. So any, even opening our hands, that is purely the working of the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit works through the preached word and through the sacrament of baptism, which opens us up to God, through the Lord's Supper, that continues to open us up and give us the Spirit. Um, not that those are the only ways the Spirit comes, but especially in the preaching and the sharing of the Gospel, the Holy Spirit enables us to do this. So, in other words, if you're not fully in bondage to sin, then you don't need total grace. You still need grace, but you don't need grace alone. So are you seeing how this works? So whatever you believe about the human situation um, tells you what you believe about um, what Jesus has done for you. I, I can see that a lot of you are still lost, and that's fine. Because it'll, it's a long summer, and you can be lost all summer. <laughs> you come back. Um, so... Um, let me just set this up some more now that I've created some tension because we got, we got about 10 minutes. Um, Luther will say, just so you hang in there on this concept, he will say, how much stuff did Luther write? Just in English, if you put the volumes, it would start here and go to about here. That's just in English. I read these books, Breck and others, and I go, I want to read what he said. If it can't, it's in German. There's tons of stuff that Luther wrote in German. It's not translated in English. So he wrote all of this. Guess what he said is the most important thing he wrote? The bondage of the woman. This issue, Luther believed, was at the heart of things. In fact, listen to what he says about Erasmus. He actually thanks Erasmus for getting to the heart of the situation. Listen to this. My dear Erasmus, I beg you now, for Christ's sake, to do at last as you promised. For you promised you would willingly yield to anyone who taught you better. Oh. <laughs> The gall of this guy, talking to the mind of Europe. Have done with respecting a person's exclamation mark. I recognize that you are a great man, richly endowed with the noblest gifts of God, with talent and learning, with eloquence bordering on the miraculous. To mention no others, and, and although sometimes Luther would just kind of throw flowery things to people, this is honest. This is what he... He believes this about Malay. I mean about uh, Erasmus. Moreover, I praise and commend you highly for this also, that unlike all the rest, you alone have attacked the real issue. The essence of the matter in dispute, and have not wearied me with irrelevancies about the papacy, purgatory, indulgences, and such like trifles with which almost everyone here too has gone hunting for me without success. Are you getting what Luther's saying here? What started the Reformation? The indulgences, all that stuff. Luther says that's trifles compared to this. You and you alone have seen the question on which everything hinges and have aimed at the vital spot for which I sincerely thank you since I am only too glad to give as much attention to this subject as time and leisure permit. Okay. And so he writes, The Bondage of the Will. So this is what I want you to... Why is this such a big deal? The doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone depends 
on anthropology. It depends on what you believe about the human condition. If you believe a human person can strive their way up to God in part or in total, then you don't need justification by grace through faith alone. You can get rid of the alone. Justification by faith, that's fine. Faith and you work together. And this is kind of what the Catholic teaching was at the time. It's a combination. You cooperate with God. God gives you grace. You strive. Boom. You got, you got it. Luther said, no. You can't strive your way up. God has to come down and get you. Completely. Totally. You are in bondage to sin. You cannot free yourself. And it's a complete act of God and God's grace. So in other words, how much help do you think you need? Well, you see, Sandy, you're a good Luther. <laughs> total, total help. Now, I want to say, you know, this is where we get into semantics, and this is where Erasmus may have been right. You know, it's like, because look what, in Christianity today, we're still struggling with these dogmas. You know, I, it was interesting to read what Erasmus believed. Because um, I hear the same... I, Erasmus and Luther are still talking today. Still talking, still debating. <coughs> I hear it from one Lutheran pastor to another. It's like now, it's like wow, oh, that's like you just quoted Erasmus. I, I, I've had conversations with pastors, not in this congregation, of course. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I've had conversations with pastors who say, you know, this whole grace through faith alone thing, we gotta let go of that. You know, that, people aren't worried about that anymore. We just need to love people and help people. And, you know, we've got to change Christianity's image. Look, we're so judgmental, blah, blah, all of this stuff. I hear this all the time. So, so the, the debate is alive and well. So this is Luther's issue, grace and faith alone. All God, not any effort on our part. All the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this... This will be uh, my closing, and then I want to see if anybody wants to, to jump in the fray before we have our youth come in, or whenever they come in, we'll keep talking until they come in. So this is from The Bondage of the Will. And don't let me forget to tell you how to read The Bondage of the Will in case you want to tap. <laughs> Thus the human will is placed between two like a beast of burden. If God rides it, it wills and goes where God wills. As the psalm says, I, am be I have become as a beast uh, before thee, and I am always with thee. If Satan rides it, it wills and goes where Satan wills. Nor can it choose to run to either of the two riders or to seek him out. But the riders themselves contend for the possession and control of it. You guys, but Pastor Jonathan said that we're just the blanks that, you know, carry Jesus last week. I can't even say it, sorry. It's my piety. Um, so, but, but Luther would say, we're, a don we're like a beast of burden. We're going to go either the way the devil goes or God goes. We don't have, when it comes to God, our will is lost. We don't have a free will. We need God's total grace, 100%. It's, there is no combination of the two. So, so this is just, I'm just giving you a taste of this. Um, I hope I haven't totally confused you, but like I say, this is what Luther feels is the most important thing. So, you know, I've got your survey about dogma and doctrine. Too many, too much. I'd love to hear from some of you, you know, why is that a negative thing? Um, what... Or also just your reaction to Luther's conviction. Maybe you're like, I think we are splitting hairs here. I think this is, you know, or maybe you want to say, this is why this is, this is why this matters. I'd love anybody, Bill, yeah. So, we got Mike? Yep. Yes, I, I think it's useful to uh, look at James, what James says on this. Yes. About faith without works being dead. Yeah. What, what does that tell us? Yes. I, I think, as I look at that, salvation is dependent on faith. Yes. Our response to this gift, salvation through grace, our works. Yep. It's sort of like a, a feedback to us 
as to how we are responding to this wonderful gift. Yeah. Great. Thank you for bringing up James. Luther would have cast you out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have done that. He would have said, yes, thank you. Um, Luther really wrestled with that book precisely because of some of the comments that seem to say that to not keep this faith and works thing separate. But a right, I think a good understanding of James is that which would be totally in line with what Luther said about the two kinds of righteousness. You have the righteousness that's a gift of Christ. I'm clothed with righteousness. That's a gift. But then I'm supposed to be righteous. Serve my neighbor. Works. And so if you don't have this, do you really have the first one? If there's nothing over here, James says, maybe there's nothing over here either. Or he doesn't say maybe. He says there isn't. So, so... I think James is a great book to come into conversation with us. You know? um, I think James is a corrective to a misunderstanding of the Apostle Paul, of who Luther really focused in on, that you can be saved and be made righteous and then do whatever you want. You know? So you, if you're really saved, you're not going to want to do that. So yeah, very, this is a great book that comes into conversation. Great. And then over here, Ken and Esley. Uh, Sue, come on up. Right. Or do we got somebody in the back too? Okay, no. Okay, so come on up to Caleb here, please. Great. Uh, maybe think of the thing from Isaiah 64, but we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Yeah. Nice. Now Luther would not have cast you out of the <laughs> <laughs> No, that's right. So all of our striving, it, it, it's not going to cut. It, Luther would say. Um, you, all of our choosing, all of all of that. Um, uh, you can, and then uh, right here to Don. Yeah, good. I, on the human condition, yeah. I it's had good. a book once, uh, I think it was called Fleet Sports 101, or something like that. But it had to do with uh, some of the countries, like Czechoslovakia, where the Germans took over in World War II. Anyway, the police force was asked to gather up Jewish women and children, take them out and kill them. Now, those who didn't want to didn't have to. But many of them said they would because they were they were thorough. But what was interesting is that as time went by, some of the men began to enjoy it. Yeah. So I think that speaks to the depth of the human situation. Any one of us could be as evil as can be imagined. Yeah. If the circumstances are right. That's so I have helped us. Yeah, that is great. Thank you. You look at that and you go, wow. You see the depravity of human beings. Okay, good. Esley, and then back to Don. Yeah. When it comes to the word dogma, to me that's rules and regulations. Yeah. And I'm kind of not wanting to go along with all rules and regulations. Right. I think we have to choose, decide which ones fit each individual. Mm. I, I mean, Yes, we've got, we can't drive on the wrong side of the road. I mean, everybody knows yeah. those rules we have to follow. Yeah. You know. yeah. But there are some, some things that are kind of middle of the road, and, and we have to kind of decide which side of the road we want to be on. Okay. I, what I like about your comment is I think, and I'll use some different language, and I may, hopefully I'm being faithful to what your comment is, that I think we need to decide what's the core doctrines, doctrine. And then what is the stuff that we can agree to disagree on? And that's, I think that's an essential part of it. The challenge is, you know, <laughs> what's in the core? And Erasmus, I think, would say, Luther, Scripture's not clear on this issue of how messed up are human beings, whether we can choose God or not. Scripture's ambiguous, you need the church traditions, you need other authorities. Well, let's just not make this a big deal. And Luther's going to say, no, this is... This is a big deal. So, very helpful. Uh, Don, and then over here, Elisa. Yeah. yeah, I acknowledge that we're very fortunate to have the real truth here. Yeah. But in my experience, as we move out of this building and, and into the world, and yes. spend, you know, 20 years with uh, mostly non Lutherans, there is very difficult for someone who hasn't been growing up here to understand that decision is not involved. Now, that's ironic. Yeah. Because we make so many wrong decisions. Yes. But it's very difficult for people outside the Lutheran fold 
Yeah. Related things. All right. To understand that decision isn't the primary. Yeah, yeah. Jesus said, I chose you. You didn't choose me in the Gospel of John. That's the one that Lutherans like to quote. But other traditions have others to support their position. But you're you're right. You're right. It's, um, yeah, very helpful. Um, wait. Or, no, Lisa. Deadly. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand. Go real close. Okay. What, did, what was Luther saying about the rationale for striving God if, if it totally didn't have faith? Luther? So the question was, what is Luther's explanation of the rationale for striving, working in your faith at all? If it's all faith, it's all gift. Um, Luther would say, if it's not from faith, it's sin. So Luther would say this, Lisa. He would say, the reason you do it is because Jesus died for you. And that's what you do for somebody when somebody dies. It gives their life for you. Thanksgiving, gratitude, love. Now, now that I've been made new, a new person, I actually see my neighbor and I care about what's happening to them. So that's why I do it. I, I don't benefit one lick from the fact that I love that person when it comes to going into heaven. Because otherwise, guess what I might do it? Oh, I do it because I love you, but I also know I'm scoring points. <laughs> see? So if you let, Luther would say, if you let... You don't divide the two kinds of righteousness, what is a gift and what you do. That those are two separate things. You're clothed with Christ. If you don't make sure those are separate, you let those that work of loving your neighbor or doing God's commandments creep into getting you saved. He says you gotta have it. Yeah. So I don't know if hopefully. <laughs> Yes, okay, back here. Yes, and our kids are in. Yeah, Good. Okay, I just maybe Please. so many thoughts at yeah. the time. But, yeah. um, first, I think with the, with the notion of the theology of the lad, continuing to do my good works because I'm going to meet God in heaven someplace when, right. he, when he's right. right here on earth. Right. Um, that, that's so, you know, part of that dogma bothers me. Sure. I, I, I said it was ambivalent to me, but yeah. I think we have to be careful with our good yeah. works as though they're checklist and we're going to meet God in heaven some, sometime um, through those good works. So we yeah. fall off that ladder so quick. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes. Thank you. And we could also maybe make our dogma, too. We have to be careful making that a word. Right. And you so know, I all of those, the, yeah. the dogma, the yeah. scripture, yeah. Uh, the sin for me, it's what it does to my heart is what's the real key here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so if the good work is affecting me positively in my heart, I can see God here on this earth, and then I think good works yeah. are to be done. Sure. But, but on the other hand, if I'm doing it, as you just said, because I'm earning points, and one day I'm going to meet God in heaven, then I think they're being done, done for the wrong reason. Right. Uh, in the same way with, with, with yeah. sin. It's a sin when it affects my heart. And, and if, if, if I can't go to Scripture and it affects my heart in any other direction, yep. then something's wrong with the doctrine or the doctrine. Okay, so I want to close this up so we can have our confirmants come in and, do, and meet with some of you and share their faith stories. So PJ, get ready to tell us how you want to do that. Let me close this up by saying this. All Christians would say that we're saved by grace through faith. The question is, you know, what is the condition of humanity? How much help you need? All of these things come in and this is a great conversation. And... Um, this is why I think it's important pastorally. I've met with many people on their deathbed. When you get close to dying, guess what you think? You think about, I haven't done enough. Have I been good enough? Have I loved my neighbor? You just start thinking that way. I had someone come to my mom's deathbed and want to know, has she made a decision for Christ? She's been in the church her whole life. And she was very sincere, sincere and she was there out of complete love. But see, when I get to my deathbed, I'm not going to be thinking about my decision. Because, you know, every day I'm a little fickle on that. Truth. I'm, I'm going to be, yeah, truth. Talk to your PJ. Um, I'm going to be thinking about what Jesus did for me. Not whether, how solid my decision was. See, that, that's pastorally why I, I have some concern and thought about this. Hey, let's just save the rest of this debate for the summer. We'll come back in September. We'll pick up here. Okay? This is great. PJ, let's let's yeah. uh, gather up and, and we want to hear 
from our conference. Thanks for making space.